To grow crops, we need healthy soil, sufficient water, viable seeds, and a knowledgeable workforce. Farmers, communities, and researchers around the U.S. are innovating to protect these resources, especially in the face of a rapidly changing climate. Food comes from soil, water, clean air, and those are all the things that are conditions for a healthy life. And farming is the massive way in which we affect all of those components. Pretty much the smartest people I know are farmers, and I don't think that they get the credit that they deserve. Once you start on the path of innovation, I would say we are the type of farmers that if we can show an improvement then we're gonna be optimistic that we can actually improve even more. The way agriculture changes this century is going to really set the vector for human history for the next thousand years. We could be on the cusp of what I like to think of as a fifth agricultural revolution, and that's an agricultural revolution that prioritizes rebuilding soil health as the foundation for both organic and conventional agriculture. Because recall, it was organic agriculture that helped take out the Roman Empire. They didn't have agrochemicals 2,000 years ago. What was the big problem? Tillage, uh, use of the plow. What really kicked me into thinking about soil restoration or regeneration was what Anne was doing to our yard. Because as I was writing the dirt book about the destruction of soil on a global scale by many societies, she had undertaken the project of turning our barren lot into a thriving garden. This is some of the soil that we started with. It's kind of gray and chalky in color. When we started out, sort of average carbon levels in the soil were somewhere around one or two percent. And when we tested carbon in this particular bed several years ago, it came in at somewhere around 12 or 14 percent carbon. She was showing how to turn it around right in our own yard. And that started to motivate questions of, well, how fast could this be done at scale? Could we actually do it on farms? So I basically went to farmers in Central America, in Equatorial Africa, all across North America, and asked them the questions of, well, how did you restore your soil? And those three practices of ditching the plow, covering up with cover crops, and growing a diversity of crops was at the root of all the farmers who had been very successful at rebuilding the fertility of their land. But the way they did it, the actual practices they used, of course, were really different on a, you know, a cattle ranch in the Dakotas versus a small subsistence farm in Ghana. And I was really impressed with how fast some farmers around the world had restored their soil in years to decades, not the centuries to millennia, that if you consult the academic literature and geology on how fast does nature build soils, you'll come up with answers that it takes centuries to build an inch of soil. Anne's built many inches of soil in just over a decade in our yard. And there's farmers around the world that I visited who've done similar things. One of the really interesting and innovative farmers that I visited for writing Growing Our Evolution was a gentleman named Gabe Brown, just outside of Bismarck, North Dakota. He was a real role model for how to rebuild the fertility of, of land. 1995, the day before we were gonna start combining, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. 1996 came along and we got hailed out again, lost 100% of our crops. 1997 came along and we dried out Drought, nobody combined an acre around here. 1998 came along, we lost 80% of our crop tail. Those four years were the hardest thing that we ever went through, but it was absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me.
because it sent me on this path of regenerative agriculture. But I had no money. I had to learn how does soil function without all these synthetic inputs. Regenerative agriculture is using the principles of nature to create an ecosystem on your farm or ranch so that all of the different organisms that you have can live harmoniously. There's five principles that are the same no matter where you go in the world where there's production agriculture. Those five principles are this. If possible, stop tilling the soil. The second principle is what I call armor on the soil surface. We never want to see bare soil. The third principle is diversity. If you go out in nature, where do you find a monoculture? You don't, there's always diversity. The fourth principle is a living root in the ground as long as possible throughout the year. The fifth principle is livestock or animal integration. Nature doesn't function without animals. We spent a lot of the 20th century learning about and understanding the chemistry and physics of soils. Understanding of the biology of soil ecology is actually pretty new. I am Dr. Elaine Ingham. I am a soil ecologist. I have worked for many years um, looking at the biology in the soil. I try to grow plants without pesticides or inorganic fertilizers, or I help people do that. We increase yields. And so a lot of times growers who are going bankrupt come to us, what can I do? Can you save my farm? And if they're good at listening to the directions and doing what they need to do, they are always successful. We reduce their costs um, and they get to keep in their pockets um, $200,000 on a 300 acre farm. We've cut diesel fuel and fossil fuel consumption by well over 75%. We've cut synthetic fertilizer 100%. We no longer use any fungicides, any pesticides. We're saving well over $200,000 per year as compared to the industrialized model. An exudate is anything that's produced by a living organism and released. When a plant produces an exudate, it's gonna be mostly sugar, a little bit of protein, a little bit of carbohydrate. There's a lot of communication going on in that root system that we have only begun to understand. The plant is putting out exactly what it needs to grow those bacteria and those fungi to do the job the plant needs. Bacterial dominated soils are not good at holding on to their carbon. If you wanna sequester carbon, grow fungi. Now why is all of that carbon not being held in the soil? Because we're tilling and we're slicing and dicing and crushing and destroying that fungal biomass. There are no fungi left in our agricultural fields. So it is absolutely not true that agricultural so soils should not be even considered in this climate change problem and in the CO2 elevation in the atmosphere. If we just get that fungal component back into the soil, if we just start building structure, roots can go way down and they can be transporting that carbon and storing it down there at depth. And where did all this carbon actually come from? From that soil that we have destroyed and turned into dirt. And if we just look at how much of the carbon that's been added to the atmosphere since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, about a third of it came out of degrading the soil organic matter in the Great Plains, in Eastern Europe, in Asia. If we took that much carbon out of the ground by disturbing the soil, we could probably put at least that much back into the ground by changing the way we farm. Carbon is a cycle, a carbon cycle. We need to pull it out of the atmosphere, put it into the soil where it can feed biology, drive growth of plants. The estimates of how much carbon we could put back in the ground through changing our agricultural practices are all over the map, but at the, even at the low end, they're like 10 to 15% of current fossil fuel emissions. But even at that low end, it's well worth doing because there's all kinds of other side benefits in terms of climate resilience to the crops, pollution reduction, and maintenance of fertility. And just on-farm economics makes it make sense today 
So it's not the environment versus the economy. We should be doing these things for supporting the economics of small farms and large farms, whether or not there's a climate benefit. Livestock are key to soil health. What happens, an animal comes, grazes a plant, that plant then sends signals throughout its, its roots that we have to slough off more root exudates to attract biology. So it photosynthesizes, collects energy from the atmosphere and the sun. Through photosynthesis, it pumps more carbon into the soil to attract biology so it can regrow. In regenerative agriculture, that's happening. In the industrialized model with animals in confinement or in a feedlot, that's not happening at all. There's a limit to how much carbon you can stuff into the ground. You know, the more you add, the harder it gets to add more, so it it'll tailor off. We've got 20 or 30 years to 80 years or so of carbon absorption capacity in the world's cropland soils. A typical farm in this area that's farming monocultures uh, with little diversity and using tillage, they're losing several tons of topsoil per acre per year, whereas we are growing topsoil each year on our fields. When I started, my topsoil was approximately five to six inches deep. Now we have recorded it down to 29 inches deep. Spiral path farm is a 300 acre certified organic vegetable farm in central Pennsylvania. We do use tillage. We can't use herbicides, so some of the reasons that we have traditionally tilled so much has been because of not being able to use herbicides, so we've had to till to keep the weeds out. When we started farming here at Spiral Path Farm back in 1979, I started with a moldboard plow. The moldboard plow is a device that actually takes the soil and flips it over. Didn't take me long to realize on these hills that we had to be very conservation minded and we switched to a chisel plow. But when we became a certified organic vegetable operation, we actually went back to the moldboard plow because for vegetables you need a fairly clean soil. But through the use of cover crops and compost, we've been able to build our soil organic matter. Hundred and sixty five degrees. It's hundred and sixty five degrees. We'll make compost. We'll look well, you know, you look under a microscope and you see that plethora of life. A lot of that isn't even identified. The last thing that I want to do as a farmer is destroy something that let alone I don't even know the name of. I don't even know what it's doing good for me. So we, do, we definitely don't want to harm our allies. People who don't live here do not have any inkling of how scarce this resource is, especially during a drought year. You're faced with losing everything around you. New Mexico has been in a declared state of drought for my entire life. We're not getting isolated dry years. It's consistently drier. Whiskey's for drinking in the West and water's for fighting. There will be conflict. The cities are sucking up our water. And once that water gets moved, we don't have the chance to get it back for our farming. So as a young person, this is really scary because when my generation is ready and we say, hey, we're ready to farm, they can say the water's gone. We gave it to City of Santa Fe. We gave it to a golf course. The water that they're wanting to build their economic future is the same water we want to build our economic future with. Without a sequias, we would have not survived, both Hispanic and Native Americans. First of all, in a sequia is a ditch. It's actually a system for sharing water. It's a system of governance, and it's a system of allocation and distribution. It's this strangely democratic tradition or custom that uh, in a sense went under the radar of all these absolutist regimes. It's true democracy. 
We get together and we vote on who's in charge of what. We vote on where the water goes. It demands relating to your neighbor because you don't do it alone. When we refer to an acequia, it's more of a community. I would say in Spanish, yo pertenezco a la acequia. I belong to the ditch. Statewide, there are about 700 acequias. They are as small as three and as big as, uh, we've seen acequias that have 400 families on them. We've estimated through the Ag Census that it's about 130,000 irrigated acres. So each acequia has an elected commission, three elected commissioners, and they're the ones who make the rules for the ditch. The mayordomo is sometimes elected by the people or sometimes chosen by the commission. The mayordomo has the responsibility of the day-to-day -day management and operation. Depending on the acequia, either the mayordomo or the commission will determine how water is going to be allocated in that season, then the mayordomo is in charge of making it happen. I became a mayordomo in March of 1963, simply because of the sudden death of my grandfather, who had been the mayordomo before. It's a challenging job. It demands physical activity. And I think that's kept me physically, it kept me moving. This is the initial diversion of the water into the ditch. The reason we have a gate there is because if we're gonna have a, especially a summer flood, it brings a lot of debris. Well, then we close it so that the debris cannot come into the ditch. That's the main head gate. He'll open that one and that allows the water to flow down the ditch to serve all the farmland that it does down below. We're at 10,000 feet right now. And this is uh, about the middle of April. We should actually have about five to six feet of snow here. If you get five to six feet of snow up there, man, you've got it made. That's basically is our money in the bank. The snowpack melts and, and feeds the various springs and streams, and the acequias pull off of the rivers. The pattern we're seeing in the last several years is that we're seeing much less snow, which means much less snowpack. Acequias flow with snow melt. So when there's no snow, there's no water. It's that simple. If that acequia did not feed this land, this would be dry dirt, dust. It would be a dust bowl. And when I first moved here, there was an acequia in the backyard, and I went and looked at it, and. Basically, I'm home. I don't know what this means, but this is where I want to be. The strength of our nation is dependent on the health of our soil and it's dependent on the health of our farmers. The bigger we get and the fewer of us there are, the more imperiled we are as a nation. The nation needs 700,000 new farmers over the next 20 years to replace the farmers who are aging out of the profession. The average American farmer is now 58 years old. I'm Pamela Hess. I'm the executive director of the Arcadia Center for Sustainable Food and Agriculture. It's based in Alexandria, Virginia. We are 
training military veterans to be farmers on land that George Washington once cultivated after he left the Continental Army. The military puts out 200,000 new veterans every year. If we could get 10% of them to become farmers, uh, we could solve this 700,000 problem. This sets up military veterans to be a, a great source of potential farmers. The trick is getting them interested in it and then providing them the kind of training that makes sense to them. Super hands-on, not a lot of theory, just here's how you do it, here's why you want to do it that way. My name is Laurent Moreo, 11-year Army veteran. I work here at Hilltop uh, Farm in Arcadia. I'm the manager of this about a quarter of an acre of field. I also run a component of the program that helps train veterans. A lot of people are like, why, why do you want to go into agriculture? It's like it's just something that it feels good. I heard the mission of needing uh, uh, more farmers. Me being a veteran, me being in the unit, uh, third ID back when I was in the military, they had a, mo a motto of uh, send me. You know, whenever something's wrong, we want to be there first. So as soon as I heard it, it like something fired off inside of me and was like, Let's still do it. He was our very first veteran farm fellow in 2015. The farmer who he was working with just picked him hands down, said this is the one. He's got the heart and soul of a farmer. He happens to have land down in North Carolina. My family has 50 acres of flat land and 12 acres of wooded land. That they probably haven't farmed since the 50s. You know, everybody walked away from farming. And so I've been here now for four years at Arcadia. And I realized about, it takes about 10 years to become a great farmer. People come in here with these big ideas like, I was like, wow, I can really come back home and put 50 acres into production. After doing the program for about three months, I realized that, that was an insane thought that I had to think I could actually uh, go back home and put 50 acres into production immediately. It's like uh, eating an elephant. You got to eat it bit by bit. You, know, you can't just eat the whole elephant. Just how farming is, you got to take bit by bit. I'm just a uh, FAR right now. So I'm spelling that farmer, you know. <laughs> so right now I'm just, I'm just far. <laughs> I think a lot of the skills that the military uh, gives you uh, over the course of the time you're in there relates directly to uh, farming. Getting up early or keeping a schedule. Uh, when something comes up, you don't, don't panic. You actually take time and you assess the situation. Whenever I meet veterans anyway, I tell them, hey man, you should maybe think about farming. Somebody that has a severe case of PTSD or anything like that, farming really is a great way to uh, slow down the mind and, and, and really nourish the soul. There is a therapeutic benefit to farming that I don't like to really emphasize because I don't want to reinforce this narrative that veterans are broken and need fixing. What we're going to find, I'm quite certain, is that veterans are going to be fixing us. We need them more than they need us. So we initiated the Los Sembradores Farmer Training Program with the intent of creating a cadre of young beginning farmers who are trained in soil health and irrigation techniques, season extension, and production of high value crops. So that we have a population of people who care about the acequias that they're on. Because if you don't have people irrigating, you're not going to have living acequias. All of us here doing the farm program also have other day jobs, and they're doing both because they really want to do this. The challenge is not that we're not ready, not that we don't want it, but we're waiting. We're waiting for, for support, for people to believe in us, for resources to do it, um, to not have debts. We need people who are going to be working the land, and we want them to be successful. We don't want them to be struggling economically. I think in the next five to 10 years, I'm going to have a lot of friends chasing me down saying, hey, how can I start doing this? Hey, how did you learn this? Where do I go? Those of us that take the time to learn these important skills now are going to be really valuable members of our communities. It gives me a lot of hope to see young people farming to be working the land. It makes me think the Asikas could live another 400 years. <laughs> I'm Mai Nguyen. I am a grain farmer. I grow heritage grains. Heritage refers to grains that came to be before the 1890s, before the development of railroads. What I really focus on 
and I think is essential is that they're unpatented. And so to work against theft of seed, breeding of seed and patenting it and taking seed out of the commons, which I think is, is criminal, um, there's this necessary work of growing out these varieties that have um, genetic richness that also are adaptive to different climatic systems. And that's what we're experiencing is a lot of climate change. We need to be able to have these seeds to switch out as is appropriate with the times, the seasons, changes in, in the landscape and with the weather. Seeds are life, what makes us able to eat into the future. Who am I? Where am I from? Where am I going? These big questions, which are the essential questions that everyone should be asking. The Heirloom Seed Project is pretty rare. I haven't found in my research any other high school that has a seed saving program anywhere near to what we have going on. Saving like historically significant seeds and near a thousand of them um, and selling them and having a seed catalog. My name is Neil Lash, and I am the co-founder and now the director of the Heirloom Seed Project here at Madamic Valley High School in Waldemaro, Maine. In 1991, we started small, and I had no idea where it was going to go. And now it's getting bigger. We're talking a thousand different varieties, 350 different types of beans, 350 types of tomatoes. We ship all over the world and we get seeds from all over the world. Um, Mrs. Jackson? Yeah. Do you know where I should put these together? Yeah, they're gonna go on that car bench over there. Right, okay. There's the biodiversity preservation part of it. And then there's the cultural aspect of it, the historical part of it. We can't save all of the seeds, so let's save the ones that have the most compelling historical connect or the ones that are the most important for us to save. A lot of requests that we get for seeds um, from people from pretty far away are kind of working on projects to kind of reintroduce a crop that was once native there. This edible achira, which is actually a canna lily with an edible root, and these were uh, grown extensively in swampy areas uh, by the Inca Indians, just blows my mind to think of where some of our seeds came from, the history that they have, the cultures that they have served. This is sweet sorghum from the Tahana Ogham tribe, and I was experimenting with that because of its drought resistance. And if we're talking about climate change, uh, we may have to be more concerned about drought resistance. Rather than sitting in a classroom learning about all the crops that are going extinct, students actually, like, they're actually getting to do something about it by actually saving these seeds. Honestly, the kids do most of the work. They run it basically with the help and guidance of Mr. Lash and Miss Castleman. Something that doesn't happen a lot where the kids run it. They're the ones who uh, need to get all of the accolades. Hours and hours of tedious work. And if it isn't done, there yeah, we've lost them. They become like the dodo birds. Who am I? Where am I from? Where am I going? These big questions, which are the essential questions that everyone should be asking. For some kids, it, it actually probably turns into kind of a religious experience. And for other kids, it ends up being a seed-saving experience or whatever. It does connect cultures and it does connect families. And we try to give them stories about how it connects people instead of what's happening in our society today, which is disconnect.
on our agricultural landscapes at certain times of the year, there's not a single plant growing out there, not one. As far as the eye can see, that is about the most degraded ecosystem imaginable. It's an ecosystem that does not occur any other time. The fact that that is necessary to grow our food as a species, that is our ecosystem, is sort of shocking to an ecologist. Ecology has not been a part of how we think about and design agriculture. Here in, in Kansas, the prairie is sort of the, the standard by which we are evaluating how well our agriculture is working. When European settlers first moved into the interior of the North American continent, they were struck by uh, what in some cases was referred to as the barrens, so poor that it couldn't even grow trees. It was something to be dismantled as fast as available horsepower and technology could do it. Our culture tends to think of this part of the country and its grasslands as empty spaces, as flyover country, as places of absence and lack. Today, we know that as the prairie, crown jewel of the ecological mosaic, the highest and, and best example of how any enduring biological system will need to work. When I think about the prairie as a teacher, I think about the work of the Land Institute to look at the prairie as the model for how we might restructure our agriculture um, so that we can think about holding on to soil, so that we can think about growing plants and mixtures, so that we can think about um, creating perennial grains for the first time. Back in 77, I uh, took the students on a field trip to the Kanza Prairie. No fertilizer, no pesticides, no fossil fuels. <laughs> there it is. So what's the difference? Well, the prairie featured perennials in mixtures. Our agricultural fields featured annuals in monocultures. Perennial plants kind of live indefinitely all of, of natural ecosystems, uh, for the most part, are, are dominated by long-lived plants. Our agricultural systems, particularly our grain production systems, are dominated by annual crops that only live for one year, often only three or four months. The more that we can bring agriculture closer in how it functions to a natural ecosystem, the more sustainable it's going to be. The prairie is an ecosystem that has evolved with disturbance in terms of grazing, in terms of fire, and that ability to change and respond is something the prairie espouses and I think can teach all of us. I've estimated that to grow corn in Iowa, over 99% of the energy used to grow that corn comes from fossil fuels. Our natural ecosystem takes sunlight, and it, with that sunlight, it, it grows plants, it builds fertility. The whole ecosystem functions on sunlight. When we build, like cut a soil profile, there is this huge, dark layer of organic matter that's rich in nutrients. And the prairie made it, those grass roots, the sunflower roots, the legume roots, dying and turning over, and the microorganisms that live in there, they built that fertility. Institute is a, a bit of a watershed moment with the very beginning of commercialization uh, for the perennial grain crop we call Kernza. I'm Lee Dahan. I work on leading the Kernza breeding program. I'm standing in front of a field of it. We developed Kernza here at the Land Institute uh, by domesticating intermediate wheat grass. Intermediate wheat grass is a perennial grass that came from the same region that wheat and rye and barley originally came from. It's a relative of those other crops that we grow and some of its flavor profile is similar to those other crops. We have to take this plant that in the wild didn't want to make much seed. It basically lived a long time and made a little bit of seed. We have to coax it into giving us a lot of seed and less leaves and stems. 
the same thing we did with all the other crops that we use, we have to do that, that same sort of shift through plant breeding. We have you know, enough grain now that people can eat it, and that's really expanded our imagination about what's possible. The first lead on that that really kind of pushed us forward was a company called Patagonia Provisions. They were looking at many different options initially and settled eventually on the first product being a beer that they would release, which they called Long Root Ale. That actually happened. The beer is for, for sale in, in Western states. The grain has become sold in various restaurants in Minneapolis and San Francisco. We still have this sort of desperate need for more research. One small research institution in central Kansas cannot address all the questions involved in developing a new crop. We now have researchers around the United States and other countries looking at different aspects of the problem. Going back 10,000 years, when the first grain crops were domesticated as annuals, there has never been a meaningful perennial grain crop until now. Kernza is merely the first of what will be many perennial grain crops. It won't take long for us to have someone working on all of the existing grain crops that feed humanity right now, and there's not that many of them. The Land Institute is also working on a grain sorghum that's a perennial that has a similar functional role in diets to corn. We're working on perennial protein legumes. It'll be a bean type of crop. We're working on perennial rice. Most people have not stepped back and, and looked at the actual way in which we're doing agriculture as being a profound problem. Once, though, that idea clicks, our experience here is people get it and they get excited about it. And they get excited about improving our relationship with natural systems. This is a solution that the planet and humanity needs as soon as we can bring it. And we've got one new perennial crop that we can really grow and eat. That crop has been like 30 years in the making, so we can't blow this. We, we gotta get it right, we need to do it carefully, but the reason for doing it right now is that it helps us to, to expand people's imaginations and begin to see, yes, this really could be real, so that hopefully they get behind us to join us on this journey of developing these new perennial crops. Here's our proof of concept to show that we can get on our way, but please jump in with us. We need more researchers, we need more support for this work. If we stop today, it would still fail right now. We're not there. As citizens of this earth, we have to be humble enough to want to not destroy what we're, what it is that sustains us. And of course, we need to sustain all the people that feed us. I see my elders working so hard, and I want them to be able to put down the shovel and know that there is a bunch of us that are ready to fill their spots. We somehow have to create about 30,000 new farmers a year, so let's get going. What's the future of agriculture? What does it look like? You know, 50 years from now, we do not have 50 years. We got to do this a whole lot sooner. The type of agriculture we're talking about here reconciles one of the greatest divides between humans and the rest of the planet, because nothing assaults the planet like our agriculture. We've basically been mining soil to feed ourselves for 12,000 years. It can't go on. Most. Farmers out there, they don't care to go out and spray these herbicides and these toxic pesticides. They know that can't be good, but they don't see a way out. Well, regenerative agriculture gives them a way out. If farmers didn't have to till all the time, they wouldn't have to buy all these inputs, that could improve their economic livelihood. We will be able to grow much more food. It will be much better for human beings because there will be all the nutrients. It's important for us to know that the earth is our maker, our defender, and 
with proper restoration, Redeemer. Thank you. 